Section 9 of Tales of Unrest, Third Part of the Idiots. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Tales of Unrest by Joseph Conrad. Part 3 of the Idiots. You go and see, mother, retorted Susan, looking at her with blazing eyes. There's no money in heaven, no justice. No, I didn't know. Do you think I have no heart? Do you think I have never heard people jeering at me, pitying me, wondering at me? Do you know how some of them are calling me? The mother of idiots. That's my nickname. And my children would never know me, never speak to me. They would know nothing, neither men nor God. Haven't I prayed? But the mother of God herself would not hear me. A mother who is accursed. I, or the man who is dead? Ugh, tell me. I took care of myself. Do you think I would defy the anger of God and have my house full of those things that are worse than animals who know the hand that feeds them, who blasphemed in the night at the very church door? Was it I? I only wept and prayed for mercy, and I feel the curse at every moment of the day. I see it round me from morning to night. I've got to keep them alive, to take care of my misfortune and shame, and he would come. I begged him in heaven for mercy. No, then we shall see. He came this evening. I thought to myself, ah, again, I had my long scissors. I heard him shouting. I saw him near. I must must i then take and i struck him in the throat above the breastbone i never heard him even sigh i left him standing it was a minute ago how did i come here madame lavale shivered a wave of cold ran down her back down her fat arms under her tight sleeves made her stamp gently where she stood quivers ran over the broad cheeks across the thin lips ran amongst the wrinkles at the corners of her steady old eyes she stammered you wicked woman you, you disgrace me but there you always resembled your father what do you think will become of you in the other world in this oh misery she was very hot now she felt burning inside she wrung her perspiring hands and suddenly starting in great haste began to look for her big shawl and umbrella feverishly never once glancing at her daughter who stood in the middle of the room following her with a gaze distracted and cold nothing worse than in this said susan her mother umbrella in hand and trailing the shawl over the floor groaned profoundly i must go to the priest she burst out passionately i do not know whether you even speak the truth you are a horrible woman they will find you anywhere you must stay here or go there is no room for you in this world ready now to depart she yet wandered aimlessly about the room putting the bottles on the shelf trying to fix with trembling hands the corners on cardboard boxes whenever the real sense of what she had heard emerged for a second from the haze of her thoughts she would fancy that something had exploded in her brain without unfortunately bursting her head to pieces which would have been a relief she blew the candles out one by one without knowing it and was horribly startled by the darkness she fell on a bench and began to whimper after a while she ceased and sat listening to the breathing of her daughter whom she could hardly see still and upright giving no other sign of life she was becoming old rapidly at last during those minutes she spoke in tones unsteady cut about by the rattle of teeth like one shaken by a deadly cold fit of ague i wish you had died little i will never dare to show my old head in the sunshine again there are worse misfortunes than idiot children i wish you had been born to me simple like your own she saw the figure of her daughter pass before the faint and livid clearness of a window then it appeared in the doorway for a second and the door swung to with a clang madame lavale as if awakened by the noise from a long nightmare rushed out susan she shouted from the doorstep she heard a stone roll a long way down the declivity of the rocky beach above the sands she stepped forward cautiously one hand on the wall of the house and peered down into the smooth darkness of the empty bay once again she cried susan you will kill yourself there the stone had taken its last leap in the dark and she heard nothing now a sudden thought seemed to strangle her and she called no more she turned her back upon the black silence of the pit and went up the lane towards plowmar stumbling along with sombre determination as if she had started on a desperate journey that would last 
perhaps to the end of her life a sullen and periodic clamor of waves rolling over reefs followed her far inland between the high hedges sheltering the gloomy solitude of the fields susan had run out swerving sharp to the left at the door and on the edge of the slope crouched down behind a boulder a dislodged stone went on downwards rattling as it leaped when madame lavale called out susan could have by stretching her hand touched her mother's skirt had she had the courage to move a limb she saw the old woman go away and she remained still closing her eyes and pressing her side to the hard and rugged surface of the rock after a while a familiar face with fixed eyes and an open mouth became visible in the intense obscurity amongst the boulders she uttered a low cry and stood up the face vanished leaving her to gasp and shiver alone in the wilderness of stone heaps but as soon as she had crouched down again to rest with her head against the rock the face returned came very near appeared eager to finish the speech that had been cut short by death only a moment ago she scrambled quickly to her feet and said go away or i will do it again the thing wavered swung to the right to the left she moved this way and that stepped back fancied herself screaming at it and was appalled by the unbroken stillness of the night she tottered on the brink felt the steep declivity under her feet and rushed down blindly to save herself from a headlong fall the shingle seemed to wake up the pebbles began to roll before her pursued her from above raced down with her on both sides rolling past with an increasing clatter in the peace of the night the noise grew deepening to a rumor continuous and violent as if the whole semicircle of the stony beach had started to tumble down into the bay susan's feet hardly touched the slope that seemed to run down with her at the bottom she stumbled shot forward throwing her arms out and fell heavily she jumped up at once and turned swiftly to look back her clenched hands full of sand she had clutched in her fall the face was there keeping its distance visible in its own sheen that made a pale stain in the night she shouted go away she shouted at it with pain with fear with all the rage of that useless stab that could not keep him quiet keep him out of her sight what did he want now he was dead dead men have no children would he never leave her alone she shrieked at it waved her outstretched hands she seemed to feel the breath of parted lips and with a long cry of discouragement fled across the level bottom of the bay she ran lightly unaware of any effort of her body high sharp rocks that when the bay is full show above the glittering plain of blue water like pointed towers of submerged churches glided past her rushing to the land at a tremendous pace to the left in the distance she could see something shining a broad disk of light in which narrow shadows pivoted round the centre like the spokes of a wheel she heard a voice calling hey there in answer with a wild scream so he could call yet he was calling after her to stop never she tore through the night past the startled group of seaweed gatherers who stood round their lantern paralyzed with fear at the unearthly screech coming from that fleeting shadow the men leaned on their pitchforks staring fearfully a woman fell on her knees and crossing herself began to pray aloud a little girl with a ragged skirt full of slimy seaweed began to sob despairingly lugging her soaked burden close to the man who carried the light somebody said the thing ran out towards the sea another voice exclaimed and the sea is coming back look at the spreading puddles do you hear you woman there get up several voices cried together yes let us be off let the accursed thing go to the sea they moved on keeping close round the light suddenly a man swore loudly he would go and see what was the matter it had been a woman's voice he would go there were shrill protests from women but his high form detached itself from the group and went running off they sent a unanimous call of scared voices after him a word insulting and mocking came back thrown at them through the darkness a woman moaned an old man said gravely such things ought to be left alone they went on slower shuffling in the yielding sand and whispering to one another that milo feared nothing having no religion but that it would end badly some day susan met the incoming tide by the raven islet and stopped panting with her feet in the water she heard the murmur and felt the cold caress of the sea and calmer now could see the sombre and confused mass of the raven on one side and on the other the long white streak of moline sands that were left high above the dry bottom of foguet bay at every ebb she turned round and saw far away along the starred background of the sky the ragged outline of the coast above it nearly facing her appeared the tower of ploughmar church 
a slender and tall pyramid shooting up dark and pointed into the clustered glitter of the stars she felt strangely calm she knew where she was and began to remember how she came there and why she peered into the smooth obscurity near her she was alone there was nothing there nothing near her either living or dead the tide was creeping in quietly pulling out long impatient arms of strange rivulets that ran towards the land between ridges of sand under the night the pools grew bigger with mysterious rapidity while the great sea yet far off thundered in a regular rhythm along the indistinct line of the horizon susan splashed her way back for a few yards without being able to get clear of the water that murmured tenderly all around and suddenly with a spiteful gurgle nearly took her off her feet her heart thumped with fear this place was too big and too empty to die in to-morrow they would do with her what they liked but before she died she must tell them tell the gentlemen in black clothes that there are things no woman can bear she must explain how it happened she splashed through a pool getting wet to the waist too preoccupied to care she must explain he came in the same way as ever and said just so do you think i am going to leave the land to those people from moribond that i do not know do you we shall see come along you creature of mischance and he put his arms out then messieurs i said before god never and he said striding at me with open palms there is no god to hold me do you understand you useless carcass i will do what i like and he took me by the shoulders then i messieurs called to god for help and next minute while he was shaking me i felt my long scissors in my hand his shirt was unbuttoned and by the candlelight i saw the hollow of his throat i cried let go he was crushing my shoulders he was strong my man was then i thought no must i then take and i struck in the hollow place i never saw him fall the old father never turned his head he is deaf and childish gentlemen nobody saw him fall i ran out nobody saw she had been scrambling amongst the boulders of the raven and now found herself all out of breath standing amongst the heavy shadows of the rocky islet the raven is connected with the mainland by a natural pier of immense and slippery stones she intended to return home that way was he still standing there at home home four idiots and a corpse she must go back and explain anybody would understand below her the night or the sea seemed to pronounce distinctly aha i see you at last she started slipped fell and without attempting to rise listened terrified she heard heavy breathing a clatter of wooden clogs it stopped where the devil did you pass said an invisible man hoarsely she held her breath she recognized the voice she had not seen him fall was he pursuing her there dead or perhaps alive she lost her head she cried from the crevice where she lay huddled never never ah you are still there you led me a fine dance wait my beauty i must see how you look after all this you wait milo was stumbling laughing swearing meaninglessly out of pure satisfaction pleased with himself for having run down that fly by night as if there were such things as ghosts bah it took an old african soldier to show those clodhoppers but it was curious who the devil was she susan listened crouching he was coming for her this dead man there was no escape what a noise he made amongst the rocks she saw his head rise up then the shoulders he was tall her own man his long arms waved about and it was his own voice sounding a little strange because of the scissors she scrambled out quickly rushed to the edge of the causeway and turned round the man stood still on a high stone detaching himself in dead black on the glitter of the sky where are you going to he called roughly she answered home and watched him intensely he made a striding clumsy leap onto another boulder and stopped again balancing himself then said ha ha well i am going with you it's the least i can do ha 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 she stared at him till her eyes seemed to become glowing coals that burned deep into her brain and yet she was in mortal fear of making out the well-known features below her the sea lapped softly against the rock with a splash continuous and gentle the man said advancing another step i am coming for you what do you think she trembled coming for her there was no escape no peace no hope she looked round despairingly suddenly the whole shadowy coast the blurred islets the heaven itself 
swayed about twice, then came to a rest. She closed her eyes and shouted, Can't you wait until I'm dead? She was shaken by a furious hate for that shade that pursued her in this world, unappeased even by death in its longing for an heir that would be like other people's children. Hey, what? said Milo, keeping his distance prudently. He was saying to himself, Look out, some lunatic, an accident happens soon she went on wildly i want to live to live alone for a week for a day i must explain to them i would tear you to pieces i would kill you twenty times over rather than let you touch me while i live how many times must i kill you you blasphemer satan sends you here i am damned too come said milo alarmed and conciliating i am perfectly alive oh my god she screamed alive and at once vanished before his eyes, as if the islet itself had swerved aside from under his feet. Milo rushed forward and fell flat with his chin over the edge. Far below he saw the water whitened by her struggles, and heard one shrill cry for help that seemed to dart upwards along the perpendicular face of the rock, and soar past, straight into the high and impassive heaven. Madame Lavelle sat, dry-eyed, on the short grass of the hillside, with her thick legs stretched out, and her old feet turned up in their black cloth shoes. Her clog stood nearby, and further off the umbrella lay on the withered sward, like a weapon dropped from the clasp of a vanquished warrior. The Marquis of Chavanes, on horseback, one gloved hand on thigh, looked down at her as she got up laboriously, with groans. On the narrow track of the seaweed carts, Four men were carrying inland Susan's body on a hand-barrow, while several others straggled listlessly behind. Madame Lavelle looked after the procession. Yes, Monsieur le Marquis, she said, dispassionately, in her usual calm tone of a reasonable old woman. There are unfortunate people on this earth. I had only one child, only one, and they won't bury her in consecrated ground. Her eyes filled suddenly, and a short shower of tears rolled down the broad cheeks. She pulled the shawl close about her. The Marquis leaned slightly over in his saddle and said, It is very sad. You have all my sympathy. I shall speak to the cure. She was unquestionably insane, and the fall was accidental. Milot says so distinctly. Good day, madam. And he trotted off, thinking to himself, I must get this old woman appointed guardian of those idiots, and administrator of the farm. It would be much better than having here one of those other bacadous probably a red republican corrupting my commune end of story